Hello, my name is Kevin Hand. I'm a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, I'm up here in Barrow, Alaska, uh, and today we're going to take a little tour of the solar system. Okay, our first stop in the solar system is the sun, our star, uh, a big ball of, of plasma. Uh, the most important thing to recognize about the sun is that the sun is a star and stars are suns. So when you look up at the night sky and you see all those stars above you, you can think of them as suns and possibly having their own solar systems, their own planets orbiting them and maybe some of those planets even have life. On to the next planet. Here we are at Mercury, the first planet out from the sun. Now Mercury is, is very hot. It's, uh, it's temperature, well, the sun side of Mercury is very hot and the, the far side of Mercury, the non-sun side, is very cold. An interesting thing about Mercury is that it's year, so the amount of time it takes to go around the sun is about 88 days. But the time it takes Mercury to rotate on its axis, so Mercury's day, is actually 58 Earth days. So one Mercury year has less than two Mercury days. And so the sun side gets quite hot, but the, the, the side away from the sun gets quite cold. Mercury is basically a big ball of rock. On to Venus. Okay, now we're at Venus. Venus is a little bit smaller in size than the Earth, but Venus has a, a very thick atmosphere with a lot of carbon dioxide. And in fact, some of the, the uh, our original thinking about the greenhouse effect here on Earth and carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas came from our understanding of what was happening on Venus. Even though Venus is further away from the sun than Mercury, Venus is actually hotter than Mercury. Venus's average temperature is about 860 degrees Fahrenheit. That's incredibly hot. That's about twice as hot as the hottest temperature you'll use in your oven. So there's a runaway greenhouse effect on Venus because it's got so much carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. Another curious thing about Venus is that its orbit is about 225 days but Venus rotates on its axis every 243 days. So Venus's day is actually longer than its year. And another weird thing about Venus is that if you were to look at the solar system from the top down, all of the planets go counterclockwise. And they also rotate on their axes counterclockwise. That's why the sun rises in the east. But with Venus, it actually rotates in the opposite direction. So the sun rises in the west in, on Venus. All right, on to our now planet we're at that's our very home. Our home, this is the only place in the universe where we know of life existing today. This beautiful little blue marble with our beautiful oceans, our clouds, and our plant covered continents. Uh, every, everyone you know, everyone you ever have known, and likely everyone you ever will know, lives there on Earth. A beautiful place to call home. All right, let's go out in the solar system. Now we come out to Mars. Uh, Mars is a cold, uh, dry planet. Uh, we think that there might have been a liquid water ocean in the northern hemisphere of Mars billions of years ago. Now, if there had been a liquid water ocean there, perhaps there was life. And right now, NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory are getting prepared to launch a robotic rover that will go and investigate some ancient rocks on Mars to look for any signs of fossilized life. Very exciting mission, and I can't wait to see the pictures that come back from that rover. Now, before we go on to the next planet, one thing to uh, appreciate as we go further out in the solar system, the Earth, the distance between the Earth and the Sun is called one astronomical unit. That's just by definition what an astronomical unit is. So Earth to Sun, one astronomical unit. Mars is one and a half astronomical units away from the Sun. So it's, it's about half more the distance 
out from the sun than the Earth. Earth, one astronomical unit, Mars, one and a half. Let's head out to the next planet, Jupiter. Oh, I think we gotta get back in the truck. Okay, we're back in the truck and we're now driving through the solar system. We passed, we're going uh, out past Mars and on our way to Jupiter. So Jupiter's decently far away that we gotta take the truck with us. Now, in between Mars and Jupiter is the asteroid belt. Um, we won't see the asteroid belt as we go between Mars and Jupiter here in Barrow, but uh, uh, but it would be right about here. And now we're at Jupiter. Okay, here we are at Jupiter. We're now 5.2 times as distant from the sun as the Earth is from the sun. So 5.2 astronomical units. Jupiter is a gas giant. All those clouds that you see, that's all gases in, in Jupiter's tremendously uh, large and thick atmosphere. Jupiter is the king of the solar system. It's 318 times as massive as the Earth. Now, along with being a beautiful and very large planet, Jupiter also has many beautiful and very interesting moons. It's got about 60, somewhere beyond 60 moons four of which are quite large. There's Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Io, the innermost large satellite, is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Volcanoes of sulfur just spewing out into space. Europa is covered in ice, and its ice has all sorts of cracks and fractures in it. We think that ice is maybe a few to 15 kilometers thick, and beneath that ice, we have really good reason to believe that there's a global liquid water ocean in existence today, and it's been there for much of the history of the solar system. And if life on Earth has taught us anything, where there's liquid water, we generally find life. So Europa's ocean is a place that I'd really like to go to search for life beyond Earth. Okay, let's head out to, uh, to Saturn. Okay, we're now out at Saturn. Saturn, of course, is famous for its beautiful rings, and Saturn is about 10 times as distant from the sun as the Earth is, so 10 astronomical units. Saturn is, again, a gas giant. A lot of gases in its atmosphere, in its atmosphere make up much of the, the volume of Saturn. Now, along with its ring, Saturn has beautiful moons orbiting it, uh, two of which are particularly interesting in the context of our search for life beyond Earth. One is called Enceladus. Enceladus is covered in ice. It's about 500 kilometers in diameter, so it's a relatively tiny world. But coming out of the south pole of Enceladus are jets of water that we think are emanating from an ocean trapped beneath the ice of Enceladus. And if there's an ocean there, maybe there's life. Now, the other very interesting moon is Titan. Titan has got an atmosphere of nitrogen and methane. And the pressure and temperature of Titan, it's so cold on Titan that you can actually take methane and turn it into a liquid. And so Titan has lakes of methane and ethane. Imagine taking the natural gas here in Barrow and having it be so cold that that gas actually condensed out into a liquid. Well. That's how cold it is on Titan, and the landscape is covered with these beautiful lakes in the northern, uh, near the northern pole. 
All right, let's move it further out in the solar system. Okay, now we're going from about 10 astronomical units to about 20 astronomical units out towards Uranus. Okay, let's go see about Uranus. Okay, we've now made our way out to Uranus. And what we've just driven in a short time would actually take a spacecraft close to 10 years to, uh, to achieve, to get all the way out to Uranus. We're now about 10 astronomical units away from the sun. Uranus is what we call an ice giant. It's got ice uh, high in its clouds, uh, a curious thing about Uranus is that unlike the other planets which uh, have their rotation axis uh, perpendicular or straight up and down from the, the plane of the, the orbit, Uranus is tilted on its side and so it kind of, it's almost like a wheel. Uh, and so we don't know why or how it got tilted on its side. There are many different theories and hypotheses, but uh, it's really bizarre that it's, it's tilted uh, almost entirely over on its side. Uranus also has some very interesting moons, but frankly at this point we haven't explored Uranus enough to know uh, whether or not those moons might have uh, liquid water in their subsurfaces. So we look forward to future missions to go out there and explore Uranus in more detail. Let's go on to Neptune. Now in order to get out to the various planets, spacecraft have to do what are called gravity assists. They swing by other planets to get a slingshot uh, to send them further out in the, uh, in the solar system. So for instance, the Cassini spacecraft that's out at Saturn right now um, had to fly by Venus and the Earth to get a gravity assist to get further out in the solar system. Right now, we're planning a, uh, a mission out to Europa, Jupiter's moon, and that would do what's called a Venus Earth Earth Gravity Assist. Uh, and it would take about six years to get out there. But of course, we're in a truck, and it takes us just a, a few minutes to get from place to place. Now we're out at Neptune, some 30 astronomical units away from the sun. Neptune is our solar system's second ice giant. And Neptune, again, this is a world about which we know very little because we haven't sent uh, an orbiter to go and investigate uh, Neptune in great detail. We do, however, know that Neptune has a curious little moon called Triton. And Triton is covered in water and nitrogen rich ice and has a few um, plumes coming up out of its ice and we don't know whether or not those plumes might be connected to a subsurface ocean rich in water and ammonia uh, but we'll just have to go there and explore okay last stop pluto even further out from neptune We're on our way to Pluto. Oh, Pluto is, is not well studied at all. Um, but in a few years, a spacecraft will do a flyby of Pluto and send us the first ever really good images and uh, information about the composition of Pluto. Uh, that's gonna be an exciting time. As you'll see, uh, the marker for Pluto here in Barrow has got a big old question mark. And Pluto, appropriately, is protected by a bunch of dogs. Now we're at Pluto, about 40 astronomical units away from the sun. 
As you can see, Pluto's got a big question mark. That's because we don't know that much about Pluto. It's a tiny little world. Now we call Pluto a Kuiper Belt object or a dwarf planet. It's no longer classified as a full planet. Uh, an interesting aspect of Pluto is that it's got a moon that is comparable in size to Pluto itself. That moon, called Charon, uh, is also a, a world that we'll investigate a little bit. So this is our last stop in the solar system, but this is not where the solar system ends. Pluto is the start of what we call the Kuiper Belt. And even beyond the Kuiper Belt, there's what's called the, the heliopause. This is where the influence of the sun uh, essentially ends. And beyond that, it's about 4.25 light years to Alpha Centauri, our nearest neighboring star. To give you a sense for how far away that is, one light year is the distance that light travels in a year. And so light from our sun, which is one astronomical unit away, takes about eight and a half minutes to travel from the surface of the sun to the earth. Eight and a half minutes from the sun to the earth. Now you get a perspective for how far light travels in one year. And the nearest star is about 4.25 light years away. A long, long, long way away. It'll be quite some time before we have robotic spacecraft that reach Alpha Centauri and the other stars. But someday, hopefully, we'll make it happen. Well, now that we're uh, past Pluto and, and heading uh, back to Basque, the Barrow Arctic Science Consortium, um, I sometimes get asked about why is Pluto no longer called a planet? And think of it this way. Uh, astronomers have been looking up at the night sky for about 400 years. Well, they've been looking up longer than that, but they've been using telescopes for about 400 years. And during that time, astronomers have found new planets, um, uh, the most recent of which was Pluto. But let me give you an analogy. Imagine that you were sitting out here at the Chukchi Sea uh, with a camera, and your goal was to discover new types of whales, uh, or new whales. And so you, you would see a whale come up and breach, take a picture of it, and you saw a bunch of bowhead whales, some, some gray whales, uh, a few other types of whales. Uh, but then one day you take a picture and, and it's something kind of small and it looks like maybe it's similar to whales, but you only have that one picture to go on. Uh, but you classify it as a whale. Then someday somebody comes along with a better camera and searches a little bit harder and takes more pictures of what you originally thought was a whale, but it turns out that after discovering more of these tinier objects, that it's not a whale at all. It's actually a seal. Now, you wouldn't go on calling those seals whales. You would now know that you have some marine life in the ocean that are whales and some that are seals. That's kind of what happened in, uh, in planetary science with the planets. Uh, we had many objects that we called planets, but then as we just started, started to discover more objects, more small objects beyond Pluto, it became clear that Pluto was no longer a, a, a real planet. It was part of what's called the Kuiper Belt. And so that's why now we call Pluto a Kuiper Belt object or dwarf planet. We have more information, more data, and we're able to classify things more accurately. So that's it for our tour of the solar system. Uh, I want to thank uh, Nock Acker and, and the Barrow Arctic Science Consortium. Uh, this is brought to you in part by the NASA Astrobiology Institute uh, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, California Institute of Technology. I'm Kevin Hand, and I hope, uh, hope you had fun.